Hey all, Tom Moran here from Tom's Big Spiders. Well, this one's kind of a special one. This one's gonna feature my Pisolotheria rufalata spider that I actually planned on rehousing a while back before we moved to our new house. I had picked up some Exoterra Nano Mini Talls that I wanted to put some of my larger arboreal species in. Well, between the move and the fact that the spider went into pre-molt and a lot of other things, it didn't get done until now. So we're finally going to go ahead and put this spider in a brand new enclosure with live plants. So first we're going to set up the enclosure for it. You'll see what I do there. I've had a lot of people asking me to show the setups. For years, I've trimmed them out to try to make the video shorter, so I figured I would include them in this one here. Plus, I'm kind of proud of this up. It looks pretty nice. So enough of me talking. Let's get into looking at my Pisolotheria rufalata, the rehousing, and some care notes. All right, we're about to set up the new enclosure for my Pisolotheria Rufalata, this is going to be one of the big Exoterra mini talls. I will flash a picture of what they look like in the pa packaging, but I think most people are fairly familiar with them. They're 12 inches by 12 inches by 18 inches tall. Now the background here is, well, I'll just show, uh, I dragged out the other one I have. It is the Zoomed cork tile background. Now these are meant for the same size enclosures. Notice on the top it does say 12 inches by 18 inches. However, I did have to throw this on the table saw and shave a little bit off of both sides to make sure it would fit in. It was a little tight, it was gonna bow out. So as for how we affix this one, if uh, I'll just turn it around so we can see it here. That right there is black aquarium silicone. That the aquarium silicone is safe, non-toxic for animals. And what I did is just Threw a couple beads in there, threw a couple beads here, put the background on and stacked some weights on it so it would hold it. So that's now affixed firmly to the back of the enclosure. I've done this before, it works really well. Now for other things we've got going here, the top, I replaced the top with one of the CNM aquarium or terrarium tinker frames. I love these things, they're just convenient. And what I like most of all about them, Somebody was talking about the fact that sometimes the lids that come with them don't fit very well. They can be kind of a pain in the butt to get in there. These fit nicely. They're very easy to get in and out, which I like, especially if you're trying to do feeding or cleaning and you want to get that cover back on in a heartbeat. And again, something if you want to just replace the mesh, I always replace the wire mesh in these because they can get their toe claws caught. It is not a myth. Does it happen frequently? Probably not, but it can happen. And when it does happen, it can leave the animal dangling precariously from its feet. And I have seen it happen with the boreal species, so I don't mess around anymore. I replace it with either plexiglass or one of these bad boys here. Now, as far as what's going inside it, for substrate, we're using Terra Aranea substrate. By BioDude, I love this stuff, I buy a lot of it. I, it's safe, it works great, it can be a little pricey though, so if you wanna to use topsoil, topsoil mixed with vermiculite, topsoil mixed with cocoa fiber, topsoil mixed with cocoa fiber, sphagnum moss, vermiculite, whatever you want, feel free to experiment. I'm just using this stuff because it's a little easier, but I have mixed my own before. We'll be putting in some Galapagos terrarium sphagnum moss. This stuff is really good. Somebody did say, and I did notice this is super, super bright green, and somebody said that they thought that they dyed it green. It was non-toxic, but they had some issues with animals picking up some of the green from it. We'll definitely keep an eye on that. I haven't seen it yet, but I will be obviously watching out for it. And then we have some leaf litter that I will sprinkle in there because it just looks really nice. And then we have a huge cork bark round over here which I got from Any Herp. I love Any Herp. They're actually in Connecticut, which is convenient as far as, you know, quick shipping. And I buy these uh, basically boxes of bulk cork flats and rounds. Now you can use a flat. I've heard arguments that you can only use rounds. I've used flats for years with them. I will flash up a picture of how I used a flat in my Pisolotheria regalis enclosure. And she was able to create a nice little den behind it, just like she would in a crook of a tree. And I'm still able to see her. The issue with the rounds, just know that if you use a round, they will usually settle inside the rounds. So you might not see them out as often. However, I've done it with the flats before and had them basically web up behind it, do dirt curtains. I can't see them anyway. So it's one of those deals with security. I've never had any issues with them being skittish with the flats, and I also see them out a lot more. We will also, which is not featured here, I have a golden pothos that I have cleaned out. I mixed a bleach and water solution, kind of the same way you would clean aquarium plants to make sure it was completely cleaned of any parasites or any possible pesticides, let it sit for a couple months, and now it's ready to go in here. So what we're gonna do is go ahead and set this up now. All right, so what we're gonna do is start off adding the substrate. Lots and lots of lovely substrate. Fancy word for dirt. And then we're gonna moisten this up. I'm gonna throw on some gloves though, because I'm gonna be playing with a lot of stuff here. 
Now, I do not mind getting dirty. It's just I'm going to have to handle a bunch of stuff after this, and I don't want to have dirt all on my hands. We don't have a sink up here, unfortunately. So now what we want to do is add copious amounts. This is a species, and I'll get into this when we actually rehouse and get in the husbandry. This is a species that does like a little moisture. They do well if it dries out a bit. They are very hardy spiders and will do well if it dries out a little bit, but it is winter time here, getting to be winter time here. And unfortunately, the heat has been running, the air has been dried out, so you wanna make sure you provide extra moisture when that happens. Oh, yeah, this feels nice. This feels so gross, it feels like quicksand. And when adding moisture, you don't wanna go insane with it. I've seen people that they soak it and they pick it up and water drips out of it. The idea is to make it moist enough so that it clumps together pretty well but not so moist that when you squeeze it, water pours out of it. That's way too much moisture. That's a good way to have the nice, overly moist, fetid tank. And it's absorbing this stuff good. And this, I like this substrate because it's got the charcoal in it. It's got, you can see the sphagnum moss, shredded sphagnum moss, which kind of acts like what, the same way for people that use vermiculite. Now see that right there, it's a little moist. We're gonna mix it up a little bit better, but it allows the water to kind of percolate through and absorb through. And if you pack this stuff it, down, it holds water incredibly well. And remember, when setting up moisture species that like a little bit of moisture, the important part is to keep the lower levels moist. The top levels can definitely dry out a little bit, or in this case, we're gonna put in some springtails at some point. So I'm gonna have some moss and stuff to keep moist areas for the springtails alive, because if you let it dry out, the springtails don't do nearly as well. Oh yeah. I actually don't mind playing in dirt, but I like washing my hands immediately afterwards. And unfortunately, we're not gonna have that opportunity. So we're gonna pack this down. It's gonna be our lower level. And that's one thing I see, especially people that use cocoa fiber a lot. They put the cocoa fiber in. Cocoa fiber, when it gets moist, gets nice and fluffy, and they put it in there and they don't pack it down. The tarantulas generally hate walking on that. So you'll see, I'll get pictures of videos. My tarantula, I think it has something wrong with it. It's tiptoeing around. It's because it doesn't like the unpacked down cocoa fiber. We're gonna add some more. And this we're not gonna be quite as concerned with moistening up. Oh, this thing's gonna weigh like a ton. Woo, tops down. So again, just kind of mixing up some of that water in here, and I can always go back afterwards and add more water to it. And we're gonna kind of angle it so it's lower in the front so we keep those vents open and higher in the back. And then we're gonna get mud all over the side, which is gonna annoy me. I'll put a little bit on. I think we gotta vacuum up here because I'm getting dirt everywhere. Now again, with moisture dependent species, when you add water, what I will usually aim for is the sides of the enclosure and allow that water to trickle down through so it keeps that bottom level nice and moist while the top level can dry up a little bit. Now let's put in our cork bark and try to figure out, this is the fun part, where you try to figure out how to put it in here in a way. I think we're gonna bury it a little bit. There we go. Oh, I probably could have shaved a little bit off this one, but. Oh, we gotta put a plant in here, don't we? Yes, <laughs> I was gonna mention that. Thank you. And so what we're gonna do is dig this up a little bit, a little spot in here and get this plant in the background. I'm gonna dump some water in there afterwards. God, there's so much dirt on the rug. In here. And again with the plants, don't pack the roots down too, too tight. I made that mistake before. There we go. Now we're gonna add some moss. Put some right around the plant in here, which will help keep some of the moisture around the plant. 
And I'm about to rip this off and have water go everywhere. There we go. Fantastic. And we'll put some behind here. And a little bit there. And then we're going to do some leaf litter. This is actually looking really good. It's one of my favorite ones yet. Now this is more for people who will come on and go, why are you putting the leaf litter in? What purpose does it serve? Well, in a true bioactive, which this is not, this is basically a fancy setup with a plant. In a true bioactive, these would decompose and help to add to that whole bioactive culture you have going in there. In this case, they just look pretty. And they will be getting a water dish. The water dish will probably be going, actually we'll probably put the water dish right in there. So there we go. We have our golden pothos. We have our moss. We have a spot that I've got a funny feeling what's going to happen at first is she's going to end up behind there. And then what usually happens with these cork bark rounds is eventually they navigate up in there, just like my oviolospes, which I rehoused not that long ago. Same thing happened. She started behind here, did some webbing, and now she is down in here. They can dig a little bit, nice spot. They'll come out to hunt. So there is our setup. Again, we'll be adding her old water dish back in when we rehouse her, so I didn't forget the water dish. But that looks pretty darn nice. Like, that's going to look great. And I'm starting basically with the tarantulas I've been keeping for a long time now. I'm at a point where I'm not buying all that many spiders anymore. I mean, I'll be adding some here and there, but I'm trying to get some of my older ones, my beautiful ones, into larger, nicer enclosures to kind of show them off. And this will definitely be a great way to show off this beautiful spider. So there we go. The setup for my Peace Letheria Rufalata Red Slate Ornamental. We will be rehousing her in a bit. And just a note, I'm doing something here that I normally don't do. Normally when I set up the enclosures with the plants in them, and I should mention this, I let the plant acclimate for several weeks to, in some cases, even a couple months before I put the spider in. With this case, we've had this plant. We took it out, I did the washing. It's been sitting in a pot for a while. I think it's pretty well established. We're dropping it in here. And I found that the pothos is pretty darn tough when it comes to the wear and tear of spiders going around. So I think this one will be fine. But if you want to be extra careful when you set one of these up, give yourself time for the plant to acclimate, for the roots to set in before you put the spider in. So don't do what I'm about to do now. So there we go. Off to get the spider and get it into its new enclosure. All right, so it's fun time. We're about to rehouse my adult female Peace Letheria Rufalata. This girl just molted, and I've been dying to get her into this new enclosure, but she went in a pre-molt. I also had to clean all the poopy off of her enclosure, but I decided it'll be easier to do when she's not in it. So we're going to get her out of there and clean the poo off again. They do love to do the old poo cannon thing and festoon the sides of the enclosure with copious amounts of poopy. How's that? We'll try to make it sound really nicer than it actually wow. is. Yeah, there we go, busting out the vocab words. Anyway, this girl had her for quite some time. I got her in April 2016 as a three quarter inch sling, three quarters to an inch or so. And at that point, I put her into a 32 ounce deli cup. Peace Letheria species grow rather quickly. So you wanna give them something that gives them some room to grow. At that point, I set her up like an arboreal, but no, with Peace Letheria, this tends to confuse people. They are arboreal species, but the majority of slings will do some burrowing. So what they'll do is go behind the cork bark, dig a little bit, make some dirt curtains, and hide beneath the cork bark. And that throws people off because they're expecting an arboreal right off the bat. Once she hit about two and a half inches or so, we moved her into this enclosure here. So this is from October 29th, 2016. And you can see we're putting her into what is essentially, this is the European model of it, but these are the American versions of the large food storage containers. They're about 5.2 liters or around five quarts or so. At this point, when you have a spider, a piece of Letheria species that hits the two and a half to three inch mark or three and a half inch mark, it is okay to put them into the adult enclosure. I had people ask that. I normally don't encourage that, but Peace Letheria grows so quickly and they're such active hunters and good hunters that there's nothing wrong with dropping a three inch spider into what's going to be its adult enclosure. In this case, I put it into a juvenile enclosure, which it outgrew the next year. So October 28th of 2017, and you can see the footage here. We moved it into what it's in now, which is one of the extra large critter keepers. I like to use these for some of the arboreals I have right now. My my Peace Letheria regalis or Indian ornamental in one of these as well and a nice little setup with a plant and she's doing great in it. This one, however, it is one of the true giants as far as spiders are concerned. Again, you can take a look here. Here is her molt and it's currently just around eight inches or so. So she's probably about eight and a half inches or so now. I've heard the species can get up to 10 to 11 inches and I have seen photos of ones that are over 10 inches. So this is a big, big spider and one with very potent venom, which is why we're going to be extra careful in rehousing this. I just had a discussion with my students this week about I was going to
going to rehouse this one this weekend, and we're talking about the venom, the effects of the venom, and I kind of psyched myself out a little bit when talking about it, because I'm like, I better not jinx myself here. So we're going to go ahead and try to get the plant out of the way, the cork bark out of the way, and try to get her into her new enclosure without incident. I have found knock on wood, most pokies will try to hide before bolting. They have natural camouflage. It allows them to blend in with stuff around them, and most of them will flatten out and try to hide before they end up throwing up the threat posture or running around like little mad spiders. So let's go ahead and try to get this one out. It would have been much, much easier had she been on the lip of the enclosure like she was earlier. So she is right underneath the cork. She's right there. And she's already a little spunky. Mm. Oh boy. I'm not gonna lie. There are some rehousings that I don't quite look forward to. This is one I've been secretly, I won't say dreading, but I knew it was coming. If you want to go right up and onto that glass, I would be more than happy. If you want to get a, a shot of her <clears throat> before she inevitably bolts. Again, with my videos, it's all about safety and getting the spider from point A to point B. Good footage is secondary. So if you're used to people that have the fancy cameras, the fancy setups to take them out and get shots of them and pose them and whatnot, I don't do that. The idea is to show people that A, these spiders aren't as scary as people make them out to be, and B, that they can be moved in a manner that is at least controlled. Now let's hope we keep with our streak and get her going. All right, so we're gonna try to get her up into this here. Hmm. Hmm. Literally of all the different ways she could have gone. Is she, is her feet, her bottom feet in there all the way? No, no. Okay, uh, no, no, there. Yeah, no, no. All right, Simply Limeade saves us again. So unfortunately, we're not gonna get a good shot of, well, hopefully those greens come out. This is a tarantula that I, I will admit that the Pisolotheria vitatas and the Pisolotheria regaluses are some of my favorite because I love black, white, and gray spiders. And for years I kept those and people were like, you got to get the Rufalata, you got to get the Rufalata. They're like easily the most beautiful spider. And I was like, come on. And then I finally got one, saw those greens, and I was hooked. So we're going to go ahead and get this out of the way. I'll turn this around. And... Then we're just going to cut the camera and I'm going to go down and have a drink. <laughs> Scotch time. A little early for that. Nah, it's never too early. <laughs> Somebody watching right now, it's 12 o'clock, right? Sure. So we're going to go ahead and put this on here. Oh <laughs> Do my old trick. Trick. No, the other way. It's that moment I realized that the... Uh, Thing isn't all the way on the back? Yeah. <laughs> oh, turn around. You're making this hard on me, sweetie. No, I don't want you anywhere near it. Oh, she's facing me. Oh. Mm. That wouldn't have been good. Hmm. Is she going to back out? No, come on. You got to go out. Out and back, out and back. Where's the little brush? Where's my little brush? Let me go ahead and move here. this. Go, 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 go. There you go. There you go. There you go. It'd be so much easier with the little brush. Seriously, where did my little brush go? I need my 
I'll brush desperately. I'll keep recording. She's good. I gotta get fire planners. Yep. Up, up, up. These are closed. And make sure this is closed. And she's in. Perfect. Oh, All right. <laughs> well, the trick is that, oh, I left the cap in there. Dang it. It's going to drive me nuts. Tempting fate. <laughs> <clears throat> All right. So let's turn this around and see if we can get any shots of her. Probably not. I will try to get some footage. What will happen is later on she'll be out and about exploring. But there she is in there. Now, as you can see, no threat poses as the light falls down. No threat poses whatsoever. No aggressive behavior or defensive behavior. What I found with these guys overall is that they would much rather camouflage. And then if you do catch them out and about and they feel like they're exposed, they may bolt. I haven't had many instances of that, though. Normally, you can keep them. If you're calm, they will stay calm. I've found that with these, specifically with Pisolotheria species, if you're calm, careful, don't poke and pride too aggressively, they will generally be able to be moved around with no issue. Now, I could have very easily have done that without using the catch cup, but I know a lot of people do not feel comfortable kind of free, well, what we call it, free transferring, where you just kind of poke and pray and hope the spider goes in the right spot. But I have done it with pokies before, where you just kind of steer them in the right direction with the paintbrush, and they do exactly what you need them to do, which is great. So these guys here, fast growers, obviously, you know, I had a sling, I had to rehouse her after years, a juvenile had to rehouse her after years, so they put on a lot of size, voracious hunters, awesome hunters, I love dropping in two or three crickets, or a large roach, and they will take it down with no problem whatsoever. Babies, I have found the one inch ones will take down medium crickets right off the bat, which is great when you can't find the little tiny crickets that you sometimes need for smaller slings. The medium sized crickets, uh, medium sized specimens, the juveniles will take medium sized crickets with no problem whatsoever. And the adults, a few crickets, a large roach, some red runner roaches. Uh, the, I don't use super worms with them or mealworms because generally they will burrow. Or if you crush the heads, you leave them on the ground, it can take them a little while to find them. Um, however, those will work just as well. And I do not tong feed, though. That's something I want to make very, very clear. I've had people say that, you know, do you tong feed them? Nope, not at all, because they will overshoot the tongs and can end up on your arm. And if you read bite reports, some bite reports are from people trying to feed old world species with tongs. The spider misses the tong, gets a little overzealous, and sinks its fangs into the hand of the keeper, which would not be fun because these guys do pack very potent venom and they are very large spiders. So you put the combination of a nine to 10 inch spider together with half inch long to possibly three quarter inch long fangs and incredibly potent venom, you are going to have a miserable time of it. And remember, not only does this hurt right off the bat and can it inflict a huge amount of pain, People have reported full body cramping after the fact and some ill effects that linger well after the actual bite. So this isn't something you want to play around with. So for the meathead that goes on and calls me the P word and says, why didn't you just pick it up and move it? Not for me, buddy. I have better ways of showing my masculinity than taking a bite from a spider that could actually have me in the hospital or having long-term effects. But again, I think that's why they get villainized because people get hung up on that. Generally, I've kept, what are we up to now? I think I've kept 14 species of Pisolotheria and never had an issue. I got one threat posture from a Pisolotheria metallica. It was because early on in my quote unquote YouTube career, I stuck a camera up in its face with a flash and tried to take a picture of it and I startled it. That was totally 100% on me. And right after it slapped at my camera, it ran away and hid. Now people are gonna ask about the old humidity. These are species that do like a little extra moisture. Again, in the summer when it's super humid, I don't worry about it as much. They always get full water dishes and I do keep part of the substrate moist. In the winter time, I'll be much more diligent making sure the mossy areas and at least down here stays moist because as this evaporates, it will raise the ambient humidity inside this enclosure. The plant will help as well. If you put a plant in with them, obviously while you're watering the plant, you're actually adding moisture to the environment, which helps. I will say though, that with a lot of Pisolotheria species, they do well dry. It's well, They seem to be one of those very adaptable species. However, you don't want to take the chance of them having molt issues. So always make sure there's a little moisture in there at some point. Just more diligent during the winter time, or if you're in a place that's very, very dry, obviously make sure that you're more diligent with the moisture. If you're in a place like the folks, all my friends in the Philippines, where it's moist all the time, you don't have to go as crazy with it. And then temperature wise, I used to raise these when we did the first video, the temperatures in my tarantula room in the winter time would hit high 60s. 
and low 70s during the winter time and they did perfectly fine, continued to eat, continued to grow. So don't worry about the information out there that's telling you you have to keep them at 80, 85 degrees. Not true at all and I have not seen very much impact on the growth rate. However, as always, higher temperatures will lead to faster growth. And unfortunately, we've got a lot of stagnant shots here. So I'm hoping I can get some footage of her later on to show off because she is beautiful. I hope maybe I have some stock footage somewhere. So beyond that, awesome spiders. I mean, there's not many green spiders out there. And for those of us who are Pisolotheria connoisseurs, for lack of a better term, there is nothing better than a giant pokey with green. I mean, it's just it's stunning spiders. And I'm really hoping at some point we can get a picture of her perch right out there on that cork bark with the green there, the green there. I mean, artistically, it will look beautiful. So there we have it, Pisolotheria rufolata, an amazing spider. Folks ask me, what is my favorite pokey? I don't know. I mean, I still love my regalis. I still love my vitata, but this one's right up there in the mix with the roof a lot. I don't think I have a non-favorite pokey. Let's put it that way. These guys would definitely be up there because they're green. So I'll do it for this one. Oh, before we go, that's right. We did go in here. I want to mention this. I did not do this on camera when I set up. I did take some New Zealand sphagnum moss and cram it down in there. Probably, Billy probably, I don't think you'll be able to see it. But I put it down in the hole because what's going to happen is as she comes up here and goes to make her den in this cork bark, she's going to have some materials to web up and kind of create a tighter enclosure, uh, tighter space for that. Keep in mind, spiders, they like tighter areas. If you give them, you know, this may look like it's adequate size for the spider, but the spider's going to get in there. It's going to feel open. It's going to feel exposed with some of that sphagnum in there. It'll be able to take the sphagnum them off. It'll use some webbing, probably some dirt, bring it up and make a nice little tight tunnel in there so that it feels safe and secure. There we go. So piece of Etheria rufolata rehoused in this beautiful aquarium. Can't wait for that plant to start growing out more and can't wait to get some images of her out and about. So one thing I do want to say that although most of my piece of Etheria species have been very Shy, more than anything, it should be noted that the Pisolotheria ornata and Rufolata are usually two of the species that keepers say are a little more high strung and can be a little more defensive. So I don't want anybody to let their guard down with these guys. They do pack potent venom and they do have the potential for a very nasty bite. I've just found that most of the ones I've had would rather flatten down and hide and try to use their natural camouflage rather than throw up that threat posture. And then when spooked, most of them will try to bolt and get away from you. So even if one bolts, the best thing to do is to stand back, get out of its way. Don't try to stop it or put something in the way of it like your hand because that's the point where you might end up getting bitten because if they do feel trapped, they can and will become defensive and they will bite. So that will do it for this one. As always, if you liked it enough to subscribe, very much appreciated. You can click that little circle right up in there. If you want to check out more videos, I'll put one of the old rehousing videos down here and something best for viewer up there. Obviously, if you take the time to comment, I will take the time to respond. Just know it can take me a few days or up to a week sometimes to get back to you. But if you comment, I'll respond. That'll do it for this one, guys. Stay safe. We'll catch you all next time.